Um, I was just going to go through, you know, uh, a short uh, presentation discussing some general basics. It's really targeted more for trainees um, who are logged in right now. I've sprinkled in some interesting cases through that. And then I'll go pretty quickly to uh, Rachel and Jacob to present some dedicated cases. And hopefully we can have um, a, a good discussion based on all of that. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And just make sure, is that uh, okay for everybody? That's great. Uh, yep. Thanks. So again, uh, my name is Ibrahim Hussain. I'm an assistant professor of neurosurgery. Um, I did my training down at, uh, training here at Cornell and then a, a spine fellowship down at University of Miami with um, Dr. Wang, Dr. Levy, and got recruited back to Cornell. Um, uh, these are my only disclosure, uh, not relevant. Again, I'm going to go through some very, very basic stuff, mostly for the trainees here. But, you know, any type of cervical spine trauma begins with the initial triage. And it's always about the ABCs, ABCs, ABCs. Uh, immobilization and a hard collar, maintaining log roll precautions in the event of any type of thoracal lumbar injuries, palpation for step offs, assessing for rest rectal tone, and doing a gross sensory motor exam. Uh, again, some very, very crude basics. The one thing I always stress to my residents, you know, before they call me and they tell me about the imaging is really just to think about the surgical candidacy. You know, do they have concomitant life threatening injuries? What's the time frame from when they were injured? Uh, what's their Asia score? What's, you know, their the hemodynamic uh, stability? And then, yeah, then to really get to the radiographic findings. Um, the Asia score, again, I'm not going to belabor this, um, you know, something that, again, every trainee should be uh, well versed in being able to communicate that. And it's uh, important to understand the sensory levels and exactly what level injury that they have that obviously can dictate um, patient reported outcomes in the post-operative period. As I start to think about how to classify different traumas um, within the cervical spine, I kind of group them into craniocervical junction um, versus subaxial spine. So for example, the craniocervical junction going from the, the occipital condyles down to C2, um, you know, the COC1 joint is responsible for about 10 degrees of flexion, 25 degrees of extension, 5 degrees of side bend. The C12 is about 50% of rotary motion. So that's the big one that I really describe to patients to make sure they understand when we're doing C2, C12 fusions. Imaging involves CT plus or minus MRI, which are really dependent on the institution that you're in. Um, I'm fortunate that I do most of my cases here at Cornell, but that being said, I cover the satellite hospitals for New York Presbyterian in Brooklyn and downtown. And uh, again, not having um, you know quick access to an MRI is something that I think a lot of surgeons ultimately have to deal with, depending on where they are. Um, X-rays is something I actually just took out of these slides. You know, I think X-rays in a trauma situation is almost um, unless you're you know Roger Hartle in Tanzania. Um, again, the 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 utility of X-rays I think in this day and age are really limited. You know, everybody can usually get a quick CAT scan. And then understanding the management, which is dictated based on whether there's bony, ligamentous, or a combination of both um, injuries, and then understanding when it's appropriate for surgery versus collar versus halo vest immobilization. Um, condylar fracture, occipital condylar fractures are, you know, you really need to diagnose these on CTs. Again, x-rays are really historical. Um, I've seen they're really isolated. They're usually associated with other types of either other cervical spine fractures, skull base fractures, or lano-occipital dissociation. And they can present with lower cranial nerve deficits, specifically hypoglossal nerve injuries, uh, skull base injuries, uh, or just basic neck pain. There's the Anderson uh, Montesano classification of condylar fractures. Um, again, types of you know type one and type two, which are the top uh, two images you see here. Uh, type one being kind of an axial compression comminuted fracture, uh, which is generally stable, and then more of a linear fracture, which are type twos, which most often are also stable. Those are usually extensions from more extensive skull base fractures. And then the type threes is when you have uh, an avulsion of the, uh, the alar ligament. And again, if that's bilateral, that's often seen in the setting of AO dissociation. Um, and those uh, may have to be required uh, surgical stabilization. So occipital cervical dislocation or AO dissociation are, are rare 1% of C-spine traumas. They're usually from high velocity um, impacts. They're three times more common in children given the horizontal plane of the actual articular surfaces, the increased ligamentous laxity, plus, you know, big head on a small body just creates for um, a larger uh, flexion moment or extension moment. These are fatal in many cases. I think most conservative estimates say that these are 50% fatal, that, you know, the patients are often dead on arrival or, or dead before they get to the hospital. Um, but that being said, about a fifth of these patients can present with uh, no or minimal neurologic deficits. 
the powers ratio has been historically used, um, you know, looking at, uh, you know, on CT scans, understanding the basion, the epistion, the distance, um, the distance to the either the posterior or the anterior arch of V1, and then creating a ratio with a ratio of VC over AD um, um, or AO in this in this image being um, considered uh, unstable. There's also the Trainellis classification, which looks at type ones, which is a anterior um, dislocation versus type three, which is a posterior dislocation, and then type two, where there's a superior inferior um, disarticulation. Um, the thing that's important to understand is that you know traction in these situations are is completely is contraindicated. I've have read, and again, I'll defer to the you know the experts in the in the in the panel about you know I've I've read about longitudinal traction for type one and type three. Um, it's something I've never seen or, or done. Um, the other thing I always you know worry about, or you know, again in the ER, they'll they'll slam any hard collar that's available on a patient. And you have to keep in mind that if you put on a collar that's too large, that you can exacerbate the uh, the AO dissociation by pushing the chin up further on the neck. So, um, you know, properly fitting collars uh, until you can achieve a diagnosis and exclude this as uh, critical. This is a 10-year-old male that was um, transferred to us. He, he was hit by a bus and then dragged for about 30 feet, had extensive polytraumatic injuries, um, intra-abdominal hemorrhaging, had third degree burns all over his body, multiple orthopedic fractures. He was taken to the OR emergently for bleeding at an outside hospital, and then ultimately transferred to us for post-operative management um, in a, between our burn and pediatric ICU. Uh, it was missed on the initial CT scan at the outside hospital that he had this increased Bayesian dense interval, which is another uh, radiographic metric that can be used for diagnosis of AO dissociation. And then by the time he got to us and we picked this up, we got another MRI that showed that it, this Bayesian dense interval had increased to about 12.45. And so typically anything in the range over, you know, nine to 10 millimeters is when uh, there can be some concern for AO dissociation. Um, this is also coupled, what I've personally found, you know, looking back at this, if you do the powers ratio, it was actually less than one. So I, I haven't found the powers ratio to be as reliable. And again, there's some literature to support using this uh, C1 condylar interval or this gap, uh, which can be on, on sagittal or coronal CTs. And typically anything greater than four millimeters suggestive of AO dissociation. And, and those clearly are met on uh, this patient's scans. The other thing to supplement that with are the MRI findings. So finding increased stir signal or ligamentous injury or T2 hyperintensity, as you can see here bilaterally, at that condylar C1 interval. The other thing you can make out here is there's definitely some hyperintensity at the C12 junction as well, and you can make that out on the CTs. So there was concern about um, ligamentous or you know splaying of the joints at not only the condylar C1 but also the C12 junction. So ultimately, we treated this patient with uh, an occipital cervical fusion. Uh, I always find it challenging to get C1 screws in when using the hinged rod, and given the concern about the C12. Uh, dislocation as well. For this patient, we ended up wiring in a uh, structural iliac crest graft that, you know, straddles over the C2 spinous process and rests on the skull base. It, this is a modified Dickman, Galley, um, Sontag uh, type of stabilization approach. And again, you can see in the bottom right that we're able uh, to reduce the uh, Bayesian dense interval. And uh, this is kind of some interoperative images showing the crest that, you know, the wiring going under the C1 lamina and then around the rods to provide some extra rigid fixation uh, of that C1, uh, given that I couldn't get screws in for the C1 lateral mass. Uh, and then on the right side, packing in the bone grafts, uh, the areas where we want to ensure that there's arthrodesis. Um, what's interesting, again, with AO dissociation is that these are high impact mechanisms. And this patient, by the time he was awake and functional, able to participate with physical therapy, uh, it was found to have a complete left C5, um, you know, not a complete left. He had some deltoid function, but pretty much out in his biceps and brachioradialis. Um, and ultimately, in a delayed MRI, was found to have this large ventral CSF collection. And on the axial cuts, you can make out here that there's a, a nerve root avulsion on the left side. So ultimately, I took him back about a month later um, after EMGs confirmed that there was no function within the C6 um, in the biceps muscle and uh, did a... a a modified double overland nerve transfer where we take fascicles from the median ulnar nerve and transpose them to the musculocutaneous nerve branch that goes to the biceps, as well as the more distal branch that goes to the brachialis. I just saw him at four months post-op. He's starting to get some twitches 
in the biceps muscles, but um, it, it still takes about a year to two years before, uh, you know, we could see any reasonable functional gain uh, in, in, uh, in that muscle group. Uh, C1 fractures are, you know, the classic Jefferson fractures, uh, the different types. Again, I'm not going to spend too much time on this. Um, the other way to really evaluate these is to look at the Dickman classification, which looks at the integrity of the transverse ligament. Um, this was, you know, the classic teaching is, you know, the C1-2 fusion for unstable uh, C1 fractures. So this was a patient is a 38 male who was in an e-bike accident, which is just very almost multiple a day here in uh, in New York. Um, helmeted, he was neurointact with severe neck pain. And again, you can make out he's got this displaced anterior arch fracture as well as a more comminuted fracture of the posterior arch. There wasn't significant involvement of the actual lateral mass itself. There wasn't any vertebral artery injury. And, um, you know, I appreciate, you know, Dan Rue, I've, I've run, you know, a case like this by Dan and, you know, discussed um, something that I'd seen done in Miami doing C1 osteosynthesis or C1 ORIF procedures, um, where the goal is to try to reduce the fracture, at least the anterior arch. We know the posterior arch fractures aren't as important, you know, as, as neurosurgeons, we're doing C1 laminectomies all the time without stabilizing them. Um, but the goal of trying to get the anterior arch uh, fracture to heal in a really active 38 year old trying to preserve motion. Um, so again, this is the MRI image, which I think nicely demonstrates that there was a disruption on the left side at that transverse ligament. And again, you can see all the stir signal on the, uh, on the, the sagittal view. So this was a patient, ultimately I, I had extensive discussion with him about um, performing a C1 ORIF or osteosynthesis procedure and understanding that if he fails, that at that point, he's going to come back and be committed to a C1-2 fusion, in which case I could bring him back, just take out the rods, put in the C2 screws, and then put in another short rod bilaterally. Um, so this is uh, the initial, or this is the post-op views. And um, this is the uh, six-week post-op CT now, and starting to see bony bridging at that anterior arch. His neck pain is virtually gone at this point now. He is rating it as a one to two out of 10. He's off all medication. He has completely preserved range of motion. Um, you know, Dan, you know, when I spoke with Dan about the optimal way to do this, the, the idea is to really try to get a lateral to medial trajectory and then take two counter torques and really try to intort them so that you're, you're essentially trying to recapitulate and push together that anterior arch fracture. Um, in this particular case, I found it difficult. I couldn't get lateral enough to really get a good lateral to medial trajectory. And so my screws were pretty straight to almost kind of the opposite direction, which was not ideal. But I've done a, a handful of these cases now. And what I found that it's not only the intorsion movement, but actually more of a compression movement. And so you, even if you put straight C1 screws in, as long as you can get that compression and then make sure that you're locking in a rod posteriorly that, that accurately recapitulates what the posterior arch of C1 looks like, that that's um, can set you up for for hopefully an optimal outcome here. Um, and there's there's been good literature that have uh, described this. Again, this is a, a study out of China and JNS spine that showed that patients obviously had improved range of motion at follow-up, but also less uh, neck disability ind uh, indices. Rick Bransford has published um, extensively on this as well. And, you know, I think this was an important paper because a lot of the, you know, when I first learned about it, it, it was that if the transverse ligament is disrupted, that the chances of this healing become far less. But, um, you know, Bransford's group is, you know, just over in Heart Review over there for the Seattle uh, folks, um, that again, these patients actually did well, even if they had uh, transverse ligament disruption. So that was uh, kind of what encouraged me to try this approach with this patient and uh, understanding that if he does develop any instability down the road, that he, he that at that point that he buys the C12 fusion. Uh, C2 fractures involve the odontoid um, versus posterior element C-spine fractures. The Levine Edwards classification is, um, I think, the most commonly used one for hangman fractures. Um, again, the type, it depends on the degree of displacement, the angulation, um, where, you know, type one, type two typically can be managed potentially um, with, with collar immobilization, whereas uh, type two A and threes tend to be more um, uh, surgical and type threes certainly are, are associated with uh, dense neurologic deficits. I always have the residents read this paper. I just found it really interesting uh, looking at the history of, of understanding hangman's fractures and the biomechanical perspective. And what I didn't know, you know, before medical school was that there's a lot of actual science that went into hangings. 
um, in terms of the mechanisms, you know, what what type of uh, biomechanical devices they needed, you know, to induce the certain, you know, extension moment to ensure uh, rapid death. Uh, you know, I read that a lot of hangings uh, initially resulted in patients not dying immediately and withering around for for several minutes before they suffocated or, or succumbed to their their injury. So I I just found that, you know this paper to be an interesting uh, historical vignette. Uh, dense fractures. Um, Again, type one, type two, type three, type one involving just the tip, type three involving portions of the body, which are typically stable, can be managed conservatively. The type twos, which are the, through the base of the dens, which is a notoriously uh, poorly vascularized region and therefore have a high rate of non-union. Um, again, I'll, I'll show some cases, but these are, I've, uh, you know, we're in the Upper East Side of New York, so, you know, 80-year-old osteoporotic women tripping over their Persian rugs or falling down their stairs or injuries that we commonly see. And uh, I think, you know, amongst even my, my partners that a lot of these patients, we end up managing conservatively, even if they don't go on to heal to achieve that fibrous non-union. Um, these are other examples. This is actually a case of Dr. Hartle's um, showing again, uh, type 2 odontoid fracture, optimal morphology, not that much displacement, both in the you know cranial caudal direction or posteriorly. Um, the fracture angle is optimal for a, an odontoid screw, meaning that it's not going from a, a, a caudal to cranial trajectory. And so this was a case that he had treated um, with an odontoid screw with an excellent outcome. Again, a nice motion preserving procedure. Uh, this is a case of Dr. Burks, a 59 year old uh, physician who had syncopized uh, with head strike. Uh, ultimately, was neurologically intact, but certainly had a clear, uh, you know rotational issue. Um, and then again, you can see here on the on the scan, uh, an anterior displaced, pretty extensive type two, uh, again, uh, uh, mostly type two, again, some of it was into the body as well. So we type two slash three, um, but with the anterior displacement of the, the dens um, for the C2 fracture, again, here you can see the, the rotary nature of, um, um, you know, some of his uh, injuries and the, the fracture you can delineate a lot better looking at the MRI, seeing the uh, hyper intense signal. Uh, this was a, you know, going through the options, can you put them in a collar, do you traction the bedside, halo, screw, C12 fusion, OC fusion. Um, in Dr. Burke's particular case, uh, you know, try, did some manual traction, was able to get some reduction of the, uh, the dens, and then from there went on to do a nice C12 fusion. And then also did a similar type of grafting technique to just helps provide extra stability. And, you know, these, I think if you lock these in, the, the fusion rates are exceedingly high, even in, in elderly individuals or those with uh, other risk, factor, uh, risk factors for non-union. Um, again, here are the six-month x-rays showing, again, you can see the wiring uh, as well as the C12 fusion. <laughs> I mentioned the fibrous, I mentioned the fibrous non-union, you know, there's extensive literature on this and, you know, anecdotally, I, I can, you know, obviously uh, the panel members have been uh, doing this a lot longer than me, but, you know, the way I've transitioned my protocol now um, is that I'll put patients uh, in a hard collar. I'll follow them to the six week mark. I'll follow them to the 12 week mark. And, you know, typically you'll see some initial fracture resorption so that the fracture may look worse maybe on the six week CT, but it's not because there's actually any more displacements. It's just because there's resorption. Um, and then from there, uh, you know, I'll get flexion extension x-rays, make sure there's no dynamic instability. And then I'll take them out of the collar, start physical therapy, and then re-image them again in about uh, six weeks just to ensure stability. I, I haven't had in my small short period of time and in short co small cohort, I haven't had any patients that have had uh, delayed instability that required going back. But again, in a lot of situations where I, you know, probably would have been more aggressive, um, taking a more conservative route uh, has has worked out well for me. And, um, you know, again, we'll, we'll get some feedback from the rest of the panel. Again, just more, more, more um, uh, literature that describing some of the risk factors that do result in delayed instability, which can include, uh, you know, the, the degree of displacement. And so uh, I think that's an obvious uh, um, comment. For subaxial spine, um, there's a subaxial injury classification scale. Again, this is more for the trainees, analogous to the telix for the thoracolumbar lumbar spine. Um, I'm not gonna spend too much time on this uh, AO classification. Looking at uh, facet dislocations, um, you know, unilaterals of, you know, a quarter of patients can be uh, intact or, or have a root deficit. 
whereas bilateral typically have, you know, a pretty dense or, or significant uh, neurologic injury. Surgical treatment can be closed versus open reduction. Uh, anterior and posterior approaches, I'll, I'll kind of talk about that more in a minute, or combination. Uh, traction, Gardner-Wells tongs, again, you can I've, I've done it both ways with patients awake with muscle relaxers and uh, frequent neurologic checks. Um, oftentimes I find as soon as they get the muscle relaxer, their exam becomes a lot less reliable. And so I've pretty much transitioned to doing most of these asleep with neuromonitoring. Um, again, you can add five to 10 pounds per level of traction then, you know, based on where you are in the cervical spine. And um, it's a little bit more challenging with unilateral facet locations because you have to try to um, be a little bit strategic about where you're putting the extension moment. Um, and uh, again, you can, you can put enough weight. Typically, you know, my teaching has been that you could put up to 50% of a patient's body weight. Um, and uh, there are certainly some contraindications, which include herniated disc, OPLL, uh, skull fractures. So uh, that's why I think it's important if you're in an institution where you can get an MRI before you start taking a patient to the operating room that you can uh, make sure you're not missing anything else that can cause a bigger issue. Certainly there are disadvantages, including failure to reduce. Uh, it causes over distraction at the other levels. And oftentimes if you can't get them to reduce, you're gonna you know, go through and do a more extensive anterior posterior reduction anyway. Um, this was a 73-year-old uh, patient of mine who, who single event, uh, came in intact, but certainly had a left upper extremity radiculopathy. Uh, you can see about 25% anterior displacement of C6 on C7. If you look at his left side, he had a fracture of that artic uh, articular pillar, the C7 SAP, and on the right side and perched on that side and then um, not, not perched or jumped on the right side. I was initially a little bit concerned given his radiculopathy and the fact that this, this bone fragment was floating around probably in the foramen. Um, but ultimately, uh, this was the MRI that showed, uh, you know, had this, if you want to call it a, a pseudo or a true disc herniation uh, with cord compression, uh, no significant cord signal. Again, he wasn't myelopathic, at least on that initial presentation when he showed up. And for this, um, just a short video, I ended up doing 50 pounds of traction. I think Dr. Goldberg and I did this case and able to, you know, ultimately get him fully reduced and then kept him locked there for, um, uh, for the, uh, just the standard ACDF. I did have an extensive talk with him uh, and his family about if he, you know, if he woke up, if we, you know, we were able to get this done, that if he woke up with any type of C7 type of issues that I would have low reservation to take him back to the OR for a posterior, um, to take out that little bone fragment and, and do additional uh, stabilization if necessary. Unfortunately, he woke up uh, intact with actually improved radicular pain. Um, and so these are kind of six month follow up x-rays and he's overall gone on to do quite well. So again, I'm sure that bone fragment's still floating around near that nerve root, but um, he's asymptomatic from it. So I didn't feel the need to take him back, um, at least in the immediate post-operative period. There have been different techniques described for reduction of uh, facet um, dislocations um, from the anterior approach. Those involve using cast bar pins, laminar spreaders, cobs, or curettes. Uh, obviously, for some of these techniques, you have to be very careful not to violate the end plate. Um, I'm not going to belabor this. And then the posterior approach is pretty straightforward. Um, you know, if there's jump facets and they're locked, you're just drilling off the little tips of the SAPs and then having the spine fall right back into place. Um, and then locking them in in that position uh, has been, you know, I think a, a standard uh, go to that can sometimes I think work more reliably than in an anterior approach reduction. Um, I'm going to stop there. And uh, I know Jake and Rachel have some cases. I'm, I'm more than happy uh, or if any comments want to be made on um, what I've discussed so far. No, that was a great uh, overview, Abraham. It really was. And I uh, hope all my fellows are here watching it as well. Yeah. Um, so I know Rachel and Jake uh, have a couple cases prepared, so I'll let you guys take it away. Thanks. Yeah, I'll, I'll start. Um, tough act to follow, Dr. Hussain. Uh, a lot of interesting cases that you presented there. Um, this case, can you see the right screen here? Yes. Uh, so this is a 54 year old male. Jake, you switch it. it. Um, oh, it display that. settings and then. Uh, yeah. Uh, to the left. The middle on the left. Yep. And they hit the little carrot right by. Yep. And then 
swap presenter view. Nice. Okay. Now we're now it's the right screen. There you go. Okay. Um, so this is a 54 year old male who presented with neck pain after a fall from standing. Uh, past medical history significant for diabetes as well as multiple falls in the setting of alcohol abuse. His neuro exam was intact except for diabetic neuropathy in his bilateral feet. Uh, given his neck pain and uh, the fall from standing, he got a CT head, which was negative, and a CTC spine, which showed this uh, C6 vertebral body fracture, um, which is fish mouth open here. This is occurring in the setting of DISH and OPLL. And the parasagittal views, you can see his autofusion of all of his facet joints and the fracture bilaterally actually at the uh, C6 uh, SAP. Uh, the rest of his... Uh, CTT and L spine were uh, just consistent with DISH, but negative for any acute findings. We next got an MRI to look for any compressive pathology that would lead us to do a, a decompression as well. And he had no uh, significant ventral core compression. He has a very small epidural hematoma and a redemonstration of his fracture. Uh, so we made the decision to take him for a uh, stabilization. Um, we took him to the OR, put him on, under general anesthesia, IOM with MEPs and SSEPs uh, and got three flips, uh, which showed uh, he was full strength in all muscle groups. We put him in a Mayfield head holder and then flipped him onto a modified Jackson table compatible with the CT image acquisition system. Uh, we got post flips, which were stable, and then got this CT before we started, which showed um, complete reduction, uh, put him back into his normal alignment. So we then proceeded forward in the usual fashion, uh, exposed C2 to T3. We put the reference array at T3 uh, and acquired a CT uh, for navigation. Uh, we placed the T1 and T2 pedicle screws and then found that the navigation was still uh, excellent in terms of its accuracy. So we were able to place the C2 par screws without getting another spin. Um, we then placed C3 to six lateral mass screws anatomically uh, took the spinous processes for more slides, autographed, and we used uh, Vivigen allograft uh, for posterior lateral fusion. Um, he did very well from this, woke up intact, discharged home on post-op day three, had been a hard collar for six weeks, and uh, his six-week uh, x-rays are shown here. So uh, if you want to just move right through to Rachel's case and stop sharing here. Hey, Jake, it's Roger Hartle. How are you? Hey. Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. Hey, just a few. Did you want to say something about navigation? You mentioned you, you used navigation, right? Yes. You put the reference array on T3, you said? Jurassic yes. 3? Or, and then it was uh, still uh, T2. We did T2. I tried to keep it to the last level of the, the instrumentation. So it was T2, put the spinous presence array on. Right. Yeah, you do. You got to be pretty careful then, obviously, with uh, if if you put in the C two screws, right? Because of the uh, because there's the fracture in between. So I just want to point out, I mean, you got to be really careful with that navigation. Yeah, no, uh, we had planned. I mean, initially on probably having to get another spin, putting the array on on C two in order to place the C two par screws, but the navigation was accurate uh, at C two, and so we we didn't need to get another spin. Yeah, we've done it different ways, um, you know, putting on the reference array on the Mayfield head frame. I, I get a little nervous with that just because uh, you're putting the reference array on a fixed point while the the, the neck is is mobile. Um, but that being said, I still find that for C1, C2 screws to be perfectly acceptable. Um, and then the alternative is obviously do a spinous process array. For these cases, you know, they're you know, for the fellows and the, you know, the trainees listening, you know, they're, they're striking, you know, you, and especially when they come in intact, it's even more nerve wracking, um, you know, just setting them down to the MRI, you know, we've, we've had patients with extensive dish who've gone, come in intact, gone to the MRI and come back plegic. So um, it certainly adds a level of <laughs> uh, anxiety to the case. But the one thing I'll, um, you know, mention to the trainees is that, again, if as long as you're very careful during your positioning, you can get the reduction or get a really close reduction just from positioning alone. Um, and then it, then it's just about or about stabilization. In this particular case, I went pretty big. He was already fused up and down. So just, you know, putting in additional C2 screws, I wasn't 
you know, he wasn't losing any more range of motion, um, you know, that he was going to notice. So um, I don't know if there's any critique at the number of levels that I, I did or if that's uh, how um, uh, how other people would have approached that. Jens, echo, great lecture. Unbelievable uh, uh, accomplishment to put all this uh, spine trauma into uh, 25 minutes or so, Ibrahim. Uh, very impressive. Um, so about Ang's bond fractures, uh, the key points there are uh, to not miss them, A, and B, uh, to um, uh, consider always uh, non-contiguous fractures. Roughly 20 to 30% of Harborview series had non-contiguous fractures. As a point of what Roger just said in terms of referencing, these fractures can be extremely unstable. So putting them into a um, standard uh, flip frame on the Jackson table can be very dangerous to them because you can displace the spine. And doing a hand turn with probably uh, three and three assistance plus one command is probably safer. A alternative that we thought of at Harview uh, can be to just do an ACDF with a longer, like a uh, um, uh, like a four um, a level plate in the front, and just put a temporary bicortical screw fixation on the front. That then can make any turning effort far easier. Uh, and sometimes a, a jagged anterior uh, fractures that can obviously tent the esophagus that can then untent also. So those are just some of the smaller little tidbits. Non-contiguous fractures, extremely poor bone stock and temporary anterior fixation to make the posterior fixation effort a little bit less arduous and a manual multi-person uh, control turns by better than a flip frame turn. I'm gonna turn the, my thing around because I wanted to show the audience briefly what happens if you miss this. This is a ang spawn patient. This is focus, ang spawn fracture, missed. Yeah, yeah, it's not in focus. I don't know how to focus that, sorry. Well, I'll I'll give up on that. I'll I'll give up on that. Make, I can see the kyphosis on that X-ray. Yeah. yeah, basically, it's a absolute disaster now. So uh, uh, he's like at a ninety degree kyphosis and was just never picked up. So these things need to be not missed, and that's probably the most important thing. Thanks. Yeah, those are excellent points. Uh, uh, with ankylosing spondylitis, uh, a lot of times, um, what you will have is if they line up perfectly the CT can miss it. And um, I had a patient once uh, like that when I was in St. Louis and uh, he had an ankylosing spondylitis. And by the time he came to me, he had a uh, like 60 degrees of kyphosis. But when you look at his original films, uh, he clearly had a fracture there. It was missed by the radiologist, but you could see it. You can see it on an MRI often better than on a CT because you see the high signal. I called up the radiologist and I said, you know, if you look at, uh, you know, this panel and that panel, you'll be able to see he's got a fracture. And he ultimately, you know, went into kyphosis and he goes, nope, there's no fracture there. I said, you know, an ankylosing spondylitis patient who complains about neck pain, who's otherwise solidly fused, has a fracture until proven otherwise, because there's no fracture there. And I said, okay, <laughs> you know, you can't, you can't fix stubborn and dumb. You, you can only fix one of those things. And uh, so, yeah, this, this is a case of dish. And I think uh, it was expertly managed and you have to go long uh, because if you don't, what'll happen is the next time he falls, he'll fracture right above uh, where right. he fell. And, uh, and so because uh, of Wolf's law, they remodel and they become osteoporotic and uh, wherever you stop the instrumentation, it fractures. So I think of the metal as like rebar in concrete. Concrete is very brittle. And unless you put rebar inside of concrete to stabilize it, the minute you have a little shaking of the earth, the all the concrete crumbles. That's why they put rebar in there. And this is just the uh, you know internal rebar that stabilizes that uh, rigid and uh, very osteoporotic long bone that the neck has become. And uh, so you did absolutely the right thing. <laughs> if you didn't go long, then it would have been, uh, I think, uh, uh, it would have uh, resulted potentially in another fracture if he ever fell again. Got it. Uh, thanks, Dan. All right, I guess we can uh, we can go on. I don't know, Jake or Rachel, you have another case or? Yeah, I've got I've got another case. I'm going to work on my screen here. 
So Jake, when you went into presenter view, do you see, do you see presenter view? Where do you see? Uh, I needed help from the whole panel to figure that one out. <laughs> Uh, I don't you, in presenter view. Um, I don't have the same button you did, so I might yeah, just skip it. Rachel, you can get out of the presenter view. Uh huh. But if I go into this one, I don't have my notes. Yeah, that's but... great. Oh, there, there you go. go. Great. Anyhow, um, so this next case is a little bit different. Let me minimize everybody. So this was a 35 year old female. She was brought in as a level one trauma after being pushed in front of an oncoming train, unfortunately. Uh, she has past medical history of depression. Otherwise her history was non-contributory. Her physical exam at time of presentation, um, severe weakness in her bilateral upper extremities, especially distally. And then she was completely out in her bilateral lower extremities, uh, loss of sensation distal to the triceps, and then no sensation of a Foley, however, reported intact rectal tone. So severe spinal cord injury at her time of presentation. So a few rounds of imaging here, but I think the most profound thing to show first is her CT scan. So here on her CT, you can see at C5, uh, she has this flexion teardrop fracture. So that fragment is shown here on the right. The arrow is pointing to that fragment but what's displaced is the body of C5 uh, all the way into the spinal canal. And the fracture is a, it's a three column injury and it runs all the way posterior into all the posterior elements. Um, not shown here, she also had additional fractures at C4 and C6, uh, I believe those vertebral bodies, which I think are shown next, um, but a very severe injury, which will continue to characterize. So you can see here at C5 on the right-hand side, that fracture extends through the transverse foramen. And then what you're seeing here on this axial actually at C5 is kind of similar to what you see when patients have jump facets. So this, so this is actually part of uh, C4 uh, anteriorly on this axial. And then the rest of this is C5. And you can see that kind of the body of C5 is posterior and displaced, it's split. That fracture, it's complex, extends into the transverse foramen on the right. Um, you can see it also extends posteriorly through the lamina at C5. And then here is just demonstrating uh, another fracture through the lamina at C6. And just further cuts of her CT scan here. Uh, you can see kind of from left to right, um, the middle is the index fracture level at C5. And then you can see additional fractures through uh, the bodies above and below, kind of her main injury level. Uh, on her MRI here, again, uh, more obvious this time, you can see that that body of C5 is posterior displaced into the spinal canal, uh, resulting in very severe canal stenosis, associated spinal cord edema. Um, and then you can also see that, that fracture fragment anteriorly, that flexion uh, fragment that we mentioned earlier, uh, displaced. So... If you, if you remember when we looked at the CT scan on the right-hand side of transverse foramen, we saw, this is more for trainees as well who are logged in, but you saw that there was a fracture through the transverse foramen. So anytime with an injury uh, that's this um, high injury mechanism and with that type of fracture pattern, uh, anytime you really have to have your feelers out for vertebral artery injury. So this patient had a pre-op CT angiogram, uh, which is shown here. She has focal uh, vertebral artery dissection at the level of the C5 fracture, uh, patent vertebral arteries distal dissection, and then she also has significant narrowing of the left vertebral artery. Uh, and then although the other segments are normal, uh, the plus side, she has no infarct on her MRI, so she had no evidence um, of stroke at that time. Here, we, these were the left-sided findings that I had mentioned so you can see that kind of the difference for those of us uh, who are a little less familiar uh, with interpreting CT angiograms, you can see kind of the difference in caliber of the vertebral artery, which is pointed out with the arrows. And so that's how you know that there is an injury at that level. So plan for this patient. In summary, she's a 35-year-old female brought in as a level one trauma, uh, pushed in front of an oncoming train. She has a C6 Asia A injury. Uh, as described earlier, she has a complex flexion fracture. Uh, mechanism here is uh, compression, flexion, um, dislocation. That C5 body is retropulsed all the way into the spinal canal. 
uh, additional bony injuries as we discussed through the CT scan, and then a bilateral vertebral artery injury. However, no evidence uh, of infarct on her MRI. So in terms of the plan for her, as she was brought to the OR, uh, fiber optic intubation is the plan. She had emergent MRI, which you already saw. An OR plan was an anterior cervical C5 corpectomy, an ACDF from four to six with traction, and then going posterior. So this was an anterior and posterior procedure, uh, single uh, OR stage, but both anterior and posterior approaches, a C2 to T1 instrumented fusion, and then laminectomies from four to six. And then at that time, there was a consideration for a treatment of her vertebral artery injuries, uh, which ultimately she did not acquire or require uh, because she did not have any infarct. Uh, intraoperatively, uh, you always get preflip baselines. Um, at that time, she had no signals below C6. Uh, Gardner Wall's traction was used up to 60 pounds. And then there was, while you're putting this weight on um, under fluoroscopy, you're watching um, for the realignment and for the reduction of your fracture. Uh, use of the intraoperative microscope, C5 corpectomy. Uh, this patient also had, as you can imagine from her complex fracture pattern and just the high energy mechanism of her injury, as she had a large dural defect. And so a dural onlay graft patch was used uh, as well as a thin layer of dural sealant. And this, this was done on the, I believe the anterior portion of the, uh, of the surgery, uh, but no dural defects were noted posteriorly. And then for the anterior portion, which I'll show you imaging for very shortly, a, a peak non-expandable corpectomy cage was used. Okay, so here you can see uh, the intraoperative fluoro. Uh, as you can see, they they got excellent um, improvement in her alignment. You can see kind of the markers from the peak cage here. And, and then the anterior plate, it's a great lateral of the plate. It's nice and flush uh, with the anterior bodies. And so these were taken before um, the flip posterior. So at this time, the Gardner walls were removed a switch to a Mayfield. Next stage of the case was done prone in an open Jackson frame. Um, intraoperative CT uh, number one is oftentimes when we're using the navigation, we'll get an initial spin um, in order to place the instrumentation and use the navigation. And then later on, we'll get an additional spin uh, to, to check screws uh, and sometimes to just check the extent of laminectomies if necessary. But uh, for this particular patient, in terms of the instrumentation plan, PAR screws replaced at C2, lateral mass from three to six, um, C7 was skipped. Some of that is surgeon preference or can be based on the size of the pedicles at that level. Um, and then a pedicle screw at T1, uh, a repeat intraoperative CT, and then uh, laminectomy is last. So from C4 to C6, uh, lumbar drain. And then when patient was flipped back, supine was flipped in a hard collar. So postoperatively, uh, she remained in the neuro ICU, initially intubated. Uh, MAP goals uh, greater than 85 for about five days. Uh, this is something that we do for most of our spinal cord injury patients. Hard collar at all times. A sub-Q heparin started on post-op day one. Uh, thankfully, she was extubated on post-op day three. Aspirin was started on post-op day five. And then lumbar drain and other um, drains were removed on post-op day six. And then ultimately, she was discharged to spinal cord injury rehab around four weeks postoperatively. So here you can see, uh, these are her post-op images, I believe from about two weeks uh, after surgery. You can see her anterior and posterior instrumentation, um, great, great improvement in her alignment. Everything is intact. And then here, I, I think this is just great at post, getting post-op CTs, uh, not just if there is a concern, but to assess the instrumentation as well as the reduction um, of the fracture. Now, we know that you know we did do a corpectomy at C5. However, you can see that overall her alignment, um, which was significantly different preoperatively, uh, is much better. You can follow a nice line from uh, the posterior body of C2 all the way down, down here. And so going anterior and then posterior, I think, was was definitely the right choice for her. Um, in terms of her post-op CTA, she actually had reconstitution of her uh, vertebral arteries at the fracture level uh, bilaterally at C5, which is what I'm showing here. So she ultimately uh, did not need any intervention for that um, after the fracture was reduced uh, and she was stabilized, this improved. 
Uh, she did have some improvements in her physical examination postoperatively, uh, namely in her bilateral upper extremity function, whereas she was out distally mainly in her triceps um, and uh, interosseous muscles in her hands. Uh, she had improvement there. And I believe she was also making some gains in sensation in her hands, uh, whereas she, uh, due to the severity of her spinal cord injury, was still out in, in her bilateral lower extremities. Uh, as mentioned, she did have some gains uh, in her upper extremity function, which will um, be uh, incredibly important for her uh, as she moves forward and then uh, spinal cord injury rehab postoperatively. So that's all I have for this patient. Uh, if anybody has any comments, questions, uh, things they would have done differently in terms of a plan. I have one question. Why was the posterior decompression done? when you decompressed her anteriorly with the corpectomy? Yeah, if you go back, um, Rachel, if you're able to go back to the MRI, yes. I just, she had such right. a, she had such a swollen cord at that level. Um, if you, if you just, yeah, you know, I just wanted to ensure I gave her, you know, listen, I, I knew the likelihood of her regaining, uh, you know, progressing beyond an Asia, an Asia A from this. Um, you know, I certainly got the ventral uh, uh, decompression, but I was still concerned that there was a degree of posterior compression. So while I was there, you know, again, I, I just felt, you know, trying to give her the best chance possible to make sure that that particular region um, where there were additional fractures, you know, they were also posterior uh, laminar fractures uh, at those levels. So those were kind of just floating around. I didn't want anything loose in that area. So that was primarily the reason for the decompress, the lamy from the back. And, and how long did it take you from start to finish? This was uh, an all day. It was a Sunday morning. Uh, I remember, um, you know, Dr. Uh, Goldberg or Dr. Bertuska and I, uh, you know, did this case. It took about eight hours altogether. Um, and then even afterwards, I was still, um, you know, there was still a concern. I spent a lot of time with my talking to my partner from interventional uh, you know, neurosurgery to trying to understand you know, what the risk of her vertebral artery injuries were because she had both verts injured um, preoperatively. You know, I, I told them to be prepared, you know, during the corpectomy, um, they were prepared to come in and put in a balloon, you know, if they had to come in and, and um, put in a line and uh, work their way up to sack the vessel or anything. Um, I had them on standby. The concern with these, you know, as Rachel mentioned, once you have recanalization, that's actually when they're highest risk for developing a stroke. So, Part of my concern also is I wanted to get her back on aspirin as quickly as possible. Luckily, we followed her pretty closely, didn't develop any cranial nerve deficits that would suggest stroke. Um, and then it was able to get her on aspirin by post-op day five. Um, but certainly uh, it was an all-day case, as, you know, just to answer that. Um, I was, it was a really, you know, picking, I, by the time I got to the, you know, the back of the vertebral body, I mean, I was picking out bone chips out of her spinal cord. Uh. Um, and then, you know, I, I put in this Dura, you know, I put in a DuraGuard on leg raft. I tacked it up in four spots around the corners just to provide some sort of protection from her getting a big um, CSF uh, collection in the neck. I left a, uh, left a 10 round JP drain in the neck as well. And then I put in a lumbar drain from below at the end of everything just to make sure that that didn't become, you know, an issue that would complicate things moving forward. This is yes. Mm -hmm. I just want to congratulate you on that, Ibrahim. This is very well handled. Uh, so, um, and the question that I have to the group then is pertaining to uh, CSF decompression and cord injury. So, uh, there's been a clear trend change uh, in terms of posterior decompressions for true cord injuries, and the trend is such that doing a more extensile posterior decompression to get above and below that area of fusiform swelling is absolutely appropriate. Um, the next boundary is, and here this was uh, solved due to the dural tear, the traumatic dural tear. Do we do elective, it's not elective, but uh, by choice uh, durotomies to get an intradural decompression to maximize uh, CSF uh, drainage and maximize uh, cord pressure. So that's the next boundary. but. Uh, if at all, my criticism, Ibrahim, would have been that you did not decompress enough. I would have probably gone C2 to whatever, T1 or something like that to get above and below the air of swelling. So, um, and a pitch, by the way, our ninth annual spine trauma symposium at SSF, and that's a virtual option also, is Friday, December 15th through December 16th with uh, many 
outside of some of the present people, but many great people from around North America and even Germany. So a uh, little pitch for that ninth annual spine trauma symposium. But the question is, should we in these severe cord injuries actually just do a very radical posterior decompression? And should we uh, do a dural expansion plasty or an intentional uh, lumbar drainage to maximize uh, intermedullary rate pressure for the cord injury patients? Thanks. Yeah, really nice uh, reduction and um, fixation. Um, and I think I, I agree that he's got, uh, she's got a lot of swelling there behind the C4 vertebral body and starting at the C3 level. So, and if you've got fracture fragments of uh, the lamina, I think you got to do what you got to do. And even at behind C6, you can see swelling. So I think it's very reasonable to do the laminectomies. One thing that uh, you can think of doing um, in a patient who is quadriparatic, or let's say that she was completely quadriplegic, um, you want to try to save as many fusion levels as possible. And uh, so um, uh, sometimes you can't get good enough fixation by just doing, say, a C5 corpectomy with a plate in the front and lateral mass screws in the back or whatever fixation. But you can rod long and fuse short and then go back and, and just remove the rods after they fuse. So just having that in the armamentarium of, uh, of possibilities uh, when you're dealt with a situation like this, that's extremely unstable. And sometimes like, just like you did with the C1 um, osteosynthesis, uh, I've done that in patients who have like multi-level fractures that you don't want to put in a halo, just go in and instrument them and not do anything. And then when they heal, go in and remove the instrumentation, and uh, and and that way you don't have to fuse them because uh, when they're wheelchair bound, you know they can only turn their body a little bit, and it's good to have that rotational motion so that they can see. Um, and uh, I think in in this patient you have a different uh, uh, situation altogether. So I think what you did was uh, very appropriate. Right now, thank thank you, uh, Dan, uh, Doctor Chapman. Uh, you know the one thing I, I did want to you know, I was curious to get the feedback from the group was, um, you know, I, I ended up using a non-expandable peak cage. I, I've used, you know, I've, I've used the harms cage. I've used the expandable and you know, a corpectomy cages, you know, from various companies. I just found, you know, this was, you know, again, this is what I had available that particular morning and I've used it before and I liked it, um, you know, with, with traction. So I didn't have to really, you know, put cast bar pins in or, or do any other type of, um, you know, I, I wasn't that, fixated on using an expandable cage. And I just found you can get a lot more bone graft in uh, through these expandable or through these non-expandable cages. So I'm just curious if anybody uses or would have used a different corpectomy graft uh, than I had used. For myself, I'm totally old school. I like fibula allograft. End of story. <laughs> I still take great pride in uh, putting that and cutting it to size and having my nice measurement tools like what Dan Rue always taught us all. So it's exactly what I still do, and I find it unsurpassed. When you do a front back, I, I don't think it really makes any difference. Uh, as long as you've got graft in there in the front and you graft it in the facet joints in the back. Um, the only thing that I, I would do if you were fusing short uh, let's say you, you just did a, a screws, you did a plate in the front and screws at four, five, and six in the back with lateral mass screws, is that I put in a cross link. And the reason is that you have two halves of the spine that are disconnected. Uh, after you've done a corpectomy in the front and a laminectomy in the back, there's no bony, the ring has not been recreated because the plate only stabilizes the above, but C5 you have two sides of C5 that are totally disconnected. And so by putting a screws into C5 and then putting a cross link across those two screws, you're recreating the posterior arch of uh, C5 and it gives much more torsional rigidity and decreases the risk of pullout. In addition, if you ever have to go back in on this patient for whatever reason, let's say she, God forbid, she develops a pseudoarthrosis at the C4 level and you've done a laminectomy of three, four, five, six, and uh, and now you got to go back in and you got that Dora, you got instrumentation in the way and it's just a pain. I just put a bunch of cross links across there and that way you just dissect right down to the cross link and you don't have to worry about it, number one. And number two is that um, um, there is a case report, three cases that um, 
um, that uh, John McMillan um, and um, I uh, helped to write because uh, he had these three cases after a, a fusion and after laminectomy, his patient was developing port signal changes in the cord. And he got an extension MRI and showed bowing of uh, the soft tissues compressing the spinal cord, even in somebody who's had an instrumented fusion. And so I suggested just put some cross links there. He did, and it worked. And so he wrote up the paper. It's in uh, JBJS uh, uh, connector um, uh, cases. So whenever I do a laminectomy like that, I, I always think if I ever have to come back here, I would want that cross link there to tell me where to stop dissecting so I don't go into the dura. Great, great cases, guys. Uh, it was really nice. Uh, Goldberg, Kotesky, really nice presentations. Um, you know, just wondering with the, I, I think that to comment just on Dr. Chapman, yes, I think, you know, people are getting a much more aggressive with their posterior laminectomies to, to because we know the cord's going to swell and that T2 signal that edema is going to track cranial and caudal to the injury and the, the cord's going to get tight. And, you know, we were, we're talking to some of our friends out at, at UCSF, Anthony DiGiorgio and, and, and some of the others out there at uh, SF General. And they're, they're uh, definitely getting more involved with the upfront expansion duroplasty and lumbar drainage um, to, to take down the intrathecal pressures and help, help facilitate uh, cord perfusion pressure. So two, two mechanisms, um, to, and there, and there, of course, this is all, uh, they're studying this as well to, to be sure that this is the right thing to do, but the, the more generous laminectomy for the patients who you think the cord's going to swell. And of course, at some point the dura becomes a limiting factor. It doesn't matter how much bone you take off the cords caught inside the dura and just can't expand anymore. So probably have some ischemic injury associated with that. Um, but I was interested about the vertebral artery injury bilateral. You know, you don't even know if you've got a dissection there or not because there's a bone fragment, there's compression, and all kind of, you know, torturous tweaking. Why not get uh, aspirin on board up front? Was that talked about? Did, did, you, did you consider it? I mean, you know, just put some, you know, rectal uh, or suppository aspirin and then and then take her to surgery just so you don't, when you reconstitute or you straighten out the spine and the verts open up, you don't have a problem. Uh, yeah. Why not? I'm sure you spoke with the... Uh, INR team. About yeah, that. I spoke with the INR and I, I, I was, I was prepared to even just put it on right, right at the time of surgery. Um, you know, part of, you know, obviously there's a concern that, you know, neck hematoma, but you know, after corpectomy, but honestly, it's somebody who's intubated in Asia A anyway, you know, that's, um, you know, the concern wasn't that high for that. Um, but you're right. I did talk about it. I discussed it with INR. The question, my biggest question was whether or not she was going to go straight to angio from the OR. Um, and so that way, the, you know, the aspirin, you know, may not have made that much of a difference or, you know, may have provided a short window of difference. But um, ultimately, the the decision was to reevaluate her um, post-op, look for cranial deficits, get an MRI stat if we had any uh, suspicion. But she was able to wake up and, again, just testing all of her basic brainstem functions, even while intubated. Uh, we had some reassurance by that. And so, again, I, yeah, I, I agree with you. I probably could have started the aspirin sooner. I, I kept my drains in purposely long. For that exact reason um but that was kind of a dynamic discussion i had with the inr guys and that was kind of what we settled on but i think you i agree with you I, in retrospect i think you could have made a case that just started up front because the risk of a stroke is i mean i could deal with the hematoma um but certainly if she starts stroking out then that's you know that's a bigger problem so i, I agree with you there dr hussein i think we have a question in the chat um, when you put the anterior cervical JP, did you keep it to gravity to look out for CSF or did you put it to suction? I put it to suction. Um, I, I even do that for my posterior, you know, if I got a durotomy on a, on a posterior case, I, this is a Mark Bilski thing from, from a mortis on Kettering, but, you know, always kept the drain on full suction, um, for the first day and then, you know, wait till it, you know, see if it thins out and then you can switch it over to, you know, bio bag or to gravity, you know, off suction gravity drainage. Again, for me, it was trying to mitigate the risk of a hematoma after the corpectomy with the anticipation that she might have been able to be extubated within a day. Um, so, you know, I kept it to full suction. And then I think eventually by post-op day two, um, uh, it started, you know, reasonably thinning out and I took it off suction to bio bag and kept that in while I was kind of playing around with the lumbar drain and until that was all pulled out. And then we pulled everything out over, you know, I think post-op day five or six. But I kept it to full suction for the first day or two. And by full suction, you just mean a bulb, bulb suction. Bulb, like a J, yeah, JP yeah. grenade, yeah. Yeah, I think once you have the lumbar drain in, you're, you're safe. Yeah. You're, you're, you're okay there. Yeah. 
Well, that was quite a uh, wild ride and uh, by an all-star group. So thank you so much, Ibrahim, and uh, your team of um, uh, colleagues. Uh, this was really very compelling, I found, and many, many good technical aspects as well as principles combined with illustrative cases. So thank you for this uh, great uh, review. Uh, Rick, do you want to take us out? Uh, sure. This was a, a terrific session. I know that you were concerned there might have been an overlap with the last session, but your cases were unique and they were very, very complicated. So I thank everybody at Cornell for participating and Dr. Hussein and the fellows, uh, Rachel and Jacob, thank you very much. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you in December. Thank all of you guys. Thank you, uh, Linda thank and Corey, you. for setting up. And, uh, you know, obviously to my partners and my fellows, thank you all. And uh, really look forward to doing this again sometime. Thanks for the great job, everybody. Don't forget to sign up for your CMEs. Take care. Good night, everyone. Good night.